So you're applying to graduate programs and you want to figure out which advisor or potential advisor is a match for you. And of course, there's not just one match out there. There are many. And I venture to guess that your first instinct is, like everybody else's, to go to their website or to Google them and find their department page or maybe they have a personal page. And then I bet your instinct, which is a good one, is to find what they've published if you haven't already read it already. Probably you have if you're interested in them, but maybe not. Their articles, their books, whatever it might be. And what I'm here to say is while I definitely recommend doing those two things, those are going to give you a highly partial, if not distorted view of a potential mentoring relationship. And that there's another technique, which I'm about to tell you, which when combined with these other two, give you a much fuller picture. Okay, first let's talk about the problem with using websites and with using academic research before we get to the actual technique. First of all is department websites. Department websites, university websites, pretty much suck. They are relatively poor indications of what a person is working on. They are often not updated very quickly, and they're more about a kind of, you know, a once every few years um, sort of self-presentation of any given scholar. So oftentimes I know that I don't, I've given you know, five or six or seven talks before I realize, like, oh my gosh, my department page hasn't been updated in a while. And when I see my department page, it has less to do with trying to give a person a sense of my, I don't know how to put it, my tectonics, my intellectual tectonics, than it is a kind of um, a rah-rah, look at me, look at how cool I am. I mean, let's be honest, it's, it's, sort, of a, it's sort of an advertisement in some, to some someone who I don't even know who it's being advertised to. It's not an attempt to make connection. That's not a, how I would describe a department website, uh, department page, faculty page, like 99 times out of 100. The other problem with department pages or websites is it comes out of a good instinct that many universities have, but it ends up having this sort of, you know, sort of either mediocre or, or maybe even sometimes negative outcome, which is tagging metadata tagging, which is very, very popular now, where basically a department administrator will survey all of the faculty in a given department, will provide that faculty with a set of thematic tags. Um, in my case, as a historian, it might be gender and sexuality, colonialism, economic history, diplomatic history, whatever it might be, uh, environmental history, and that invites each of the faculty members to choose which of those tags they want applied to their profile, such that if an applicant were to click on environmental history, it should in theory bring up only those faculty member who have designated themselves as having some connection to that. Okay, that's cool, that's great. Except when I am presented with 30 tags, I go all hungry, hungry hippo. If you're too young to know that reference, I apologize, but I go into a sort of like acquisitive acquiring mode. And I'm like, yeah, I care about that. Oh yeah, I totally care about environmental history. I totally care about gender and sexuality. Oh yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I, you know, I cover World War II in my lectures, military history, you got it. And I end up sort of compiling tags that in all honesty have very, very little to do with in concrete terms with what I do in my research profile. And that's because these are opt-in, these are optional. The department administrator or the chair, whoever it is, is never gonna say, uh, Dr. Frank, uh, Dr. Vesuvius, um, you don't really work on, <laughs> I don't know, you don't really work on uh, economic history, so we're not gonna allow you to apply that tag. They're not gonna do that. They're gonna say like, whatever the faculty member self-designates, that's what we'll do. Now the problem is, from the perspective of a potential applicant, you have no idea at all whether or not the tag that I have chosen or the 10 tags I have chosen, which of those are really, really, really me and which ones are aspirationally me or kind of tangentially me. So department pages are notoriously bad for this. I get emails quite regularly where someone says, I'm interested in working with you because you are a leading expert on blah. And it's like, oh yeah, I know where you got that. You got that from the, from the website. And I don't blame you, but I am not a leading expert in blah. 
I'm just sort of interested in it, and I probably shouldn't have added that metadata tag out there, so be it. Okay, so that's why websites are a bit tricky when it comes to figuring out who a potential advisor might be. What about reading people's articles or books? Shouldn't that work? Because in theory, you want to work with someone whose expertise are those <laughs> that you're drawn to, that you want to learn from, etc. Well, the answer is yes and no. So here's the problem. If this were a mentorship program designed for, I don't know, 1935 academia, 1955, 1965, 75, then the answer would be absolutely yes, in the sense that more then than now, the goal of advising was to create little mini-me's, was to reproduce oneself intellectually to the point where advisors, it was not uncommon for advisors to choose the dissertation topics for their advisees or to shape them, at the very least, very heavily. That is predominantly not true um, now as compared to then. Yes, it still happens. Yes, it's differential um, depending upon what field you're in. But in the humanities and social sciences, for example, that as a model is far, far less prevalent than it was in the past. I cannot speak to STEM, but in the number of graduate students who I have worked with and met in STEM fields, I know that they have a, a fair amount, if not a lot of autonomy in figuring out their pathways through their career. Now, of course, if they're working within a particular laboratory with a particular focus, you know, obviously there are parameters, but uh, there's more autonomy ever um, as compared to before. So this is the problem. If someone were to um, apply, let's say, use that example of the anthropologist of Senegal, then they might be led to believe that, oh, I work on the anthropology of Senegal, so therefore I need to find exact, and I work on this particular subject, this particular topic, therefore my goal in finding an advisor is to find someone who works on exactly what it is that I want to do. Um, to the point, and this is the dangerous part, where if someone has that assumption, an applicant has that assumption, they might custom tailor their own intellectual concerns, their own intellectual kind of research goals to mimic the interests of a potential advisor operating under the false assumption of a 1935 model where is the advisor reproduces themselves in the advisee. And so I can speak from experience, not only in my own graduate school, but across the board, you know, in my, in my years of teaching, that I do not know of any graduate advisors who attempt to reproduce themselves in the work of their advisees. They shape it, they influence it. They're, of course, paradigmatic kind of impact of working with somebody, no doubt. But I know more advisors who work with advisees who work on subjects that are really far afield from what the advisor has subject expertise in. Let me give you a sense just from myself of some of the projects I have seen in my own world. Most recently, one of my most recent advisees uh, who has gone on to become assistant professor, I won't embarrass uh, him by name, but uh, has Chinese, Russian, Japanese, and English as uh, their languages, works in urban history, works in questions of large-scale infrastructure and energy, works in, and I could go down the list uh, here, um, works on questions of kind of comparative colonialism and various other subject matter. These are not the kinds of keywords that most people use when they think about my research. I don't use Russian. I don't, I do use Japanese, but not nearly to the extent of this person. Um, I don't work on urban history at all. And yet we had an amazing um, kind of advisor advisee relationship. I mean, he was actually co-advised with a brilliant colleague of mine. But this is just to say, this is the norm in my experience, not the exception. And so when you're trying to think about who a good match might be, yes, you want to be inspired by the work of a potential advisor. You want to be drawn to it, but you don't want to... Um, sort of think about it in a really narrow case study kind of way where you only imagine mentorship relationships with people, with scholars who only work exactly on what it is that you have been thinking about doing. 
What you really want, and this is where I'm going to get to my sort of tip, and I know you've been waiting for that. I apologize for the, for the delayed gratification. But what you really want to uh, find is a relationship in which the mode of thought, the, mo the method of work, the, the approach to scholarship of, your, of that potential advisor that's the thing that attracts you. That's what you want to learn. Like that's when you look at someone and you say, I want to learn how to think like that. Um, I think I, that, that I'm drawn to that. So how do you figure that out? Um, while still being you, while still being you with your own concerns, with your own path. So how do you do that? Very, very simply. The advice I'm going to give presumes that you do have um, institutional access. Um, and institutional access in this particular case could be many different public institutions. Um, and there is a public search version of what I'm about to bring up, although the search functionality for the public version, for the completely online version, is a little bit limited, but still there. And this is the ProQuest Dissertation and Thesis Database. So this is basically a repository of information on recently submitted or filed master's theses and PhD dissertations in a whole number of different institutions. It's not comprehensive, but it's a really, really big database. And what you want to do is this. You want to run a search to determine what are the dissertations that were produced under the mentorship of the person you are considering working with. And you can do this in one of really three ways. First is you could just do keyword searches uh, having to do with your general subject matter and then just comb through the results to try to find the exact university and the exact advisor, um, you know, um, and then disregard the rest. That's a really inefficient way. Or, and here's the really key part, you can run advanced searches within ProQuest where you actually designate within the search functionality the advisor's name. So you can plug in, show me every dissertation that Mullaney served as advisor for, whether primary or secondary. And if you run your search terms correctly, you will find all of the dissertations that I, in a mentorship capacity, had a role in shaping. And what you'll discover is the diversity of them. And if you do this with any potential advisor, you will discover the diversity of potential topics. And yet, you will be able to see, just by reading the abstract, because most of the dissertations are not full PDF, you're not going to be able to read the, P the dissertations themselves by and large, but just the title, the abstract, maybe the table of contents of the dissertation, you will be able to detect a kind of Venn diagram core to the kinds of dissertations that a particular advisor has a role in shaping. And you'll be able, therefore, to understand the diversity and possibility and kind of, you know, expansiveness of it, but also the core kernel that lies at the heart, whether methodologically or theoretically or empirically or rhetorically, within that, let's say, advisor's program. That's how you can figure out whether someone is right for you. Can Do I like these other dissertations? Do they seem exciting to me? Do they resonate with what I'm concerned with? Or do they bore me to tears? Do they seem just, just shitty, shitty, boring, boring? Like, that's a clue. If you find all, or you know, sometimes it's not completely updated, but if you find a good number of dissertations by someone you're considering applying to, and you find every single one of the dissertations just boring as dirt, maybe that's not the right advisor for you. But maybe there's another person out there whose own research seems a little bit you know, distant from yours, but then you see who they advised and the dissertations they help advise. And you look at that and you say, wow, look at these dissertations. Like I want to read them. They look, and they might be on a whole different, a whole bunch of different topics that are unrelated to your work, but you can feel a resonance with them. And you say, wow, nothing about their website would have told me this. Nothing about their own art, their own research, their own articles, their own books would have told me this, but this might be the person for me. 
And now you are equipped to really reach out and start those preliminary conversations about whether or not someone's, you know, uh, reviewing applications this season. Um, you know, are they are they admitting students? That kind of thing prior to submitting your application. I'll see you in the next tutorial.